From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Wake up. What is up, everybody? It is Wake Up War Champ, presented by the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, Tallahassee, Florida. Coming up on today's show, breaking down the press conferences, looking ahead a little bit to Georgia Tech as well. Wake Up War Champ, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, cptallybar.com. That is the website. But it's Tuesday. You already know. It's Taco Tuesday. All day long, specials on tacos and Coronas. And it gets you ready for big-time trivia on Tuesday nights mm. at the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. What time does trivia start up, Corey Clark? Oh, man, oh, man, 7? Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to put I, you on a spot like that. But yeah, kind of I was going to say 7.30, but I think it's 7. So either way, get there at 7, and if you have to wait an extra 30 minutes, so be it. TVs are working and the beer's flowing. That's right, Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Also, Friday, go hang out at Corner Pocket Bar and Grill from 5.30 to 6.30, and you'll see Jeff Cameron and Corey Clark entertaining the masses live as part of their happy hour, it'll be on YouTube. But, hey, if you're in Tallahassee, go to the Corner Pocket. Check it out in the flesh. And you can also put flesh on flesh, some handshakes. Dap it up with Corey and Jeff after the show. They like hanging out, hearing mm. from you folks, talking to you and all that kind of stuff. So check that out. And then Saturday, game day, pregame show, War Chant Game Day presented by Zaxby's atop the Hotel Indigo in College Town. This is a stone's throw from Dote Campbell. Sam, come hang out, get some drinks, cash bar. Also a buffet-style tailgate in an air-conditioned atmosphere, which apparently it's back to being summer in Tallahassee right now, Corey Clark. Who'd have thunk it? So it's going to be hot again. Uh, come hang out indoors and watch Jeff and Tom kicking it for you folks. So everything going as we are back into game week, which also means on Mondays we spoke to head football coach Mike Novell and all the coordinators. Corey, we could have used you there. We could have used you there, Corey. But man, it's tough though, right? Like you got them all last week yeah. and nothing has happened since then. Right. So right. I get it. I get why there would be a dearth of questions. Mm -hmm. What are you going to ask them? What'd you know. do this weekend? You know I mean? Like it, this, there wasn't much to ask them that wasn't asked uh, the week prior, but I loved it. It was a, it was an easy transcription for me. It's less than an hour. Usually that thing goes on. It's like, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I was going to say Schindler's list. I hate making oh. that reference, but, but it's like a PBS only the length of it. Right. The right. length of it. Yeah, I should have. Hoop Dreams. There you go. Yeah. Kids, if you haven't seen Hoop Dreams, it's an incredible documentary from the mid-90s. Go watch it. Inse best movie I've ever seen, legitimately. Carve out several days out of your schedule, though, to watch it, though. Of course. No, no, it's three and a half hours. Oof. Just, you Oof. know, it's, it's, you can do it. You can do it. I know people binge, like, whole seasons of shows. You can go watch a three-hour documentary. It's incredible. We'll try a tap dance for another 20 or so minutes to give you folks a show, but not a lot of meat on the bone. Did want to talk about this. Just want to gripe. Don't, I know sell, people it, like, don't I, sell it like that. Well, I'm being I honest mean, with the people. Some, they appreciate right. our transparency. Uh, they also like hearing me complain. Uh, that's what's kept mm. everybody around here for five years that we've done this show. Really, man? We're going to kick off again 730 against Miami? What does this yeah. mean for our travel, Corey? I'm going to spend the night in Miami for two nights and then drive back up at like 9 in the morning to Tallahassee on Sunday. That show's yeah, that's a killer. bummer about the uh, having to be there Saturday night, having uh, to be there an extra night Saturday night's a bit of a bummer. Um, yeah, I, I was very surprised by that. I thought it would be 3.30. Um, usually it's either a night game or 3.30 down there. I don't remember a noon game down there for a while, maybe since I've even been covering the team. Was it 18, um, 3.30 or was it 18 noon? I thought that was 3.30, right? Okay, I thought yeah, that probably. game ended when it was dark. Yeah, yeah you're um, right, you're right, you're right. It got real dark there in the, the second half. I remember that much. Um, but, uh, yeah, man, I, I guess they must have known that Georgia, Tennessee was going to be at three 30 and the ACC and the ESPN, I guess, still think of Florida state Miami as a marquee game for this conference. And they didn't want to butt heads with, you know, number one versus number three. Um, so once they found out that Georgia, Tennessee was going to be a three 30 game, they're like, well, let's bump that back to seven 30 because more people would watch. Florida state Miami at seven 30 when the opposite game is, I don't know, man, Alabama, LSU. That's not well, that's a, that, that's know, SEC West title might be on the line, man. I know, but it's like, you know, I don't I don't that's not as big a deal as Georgia, Tennessee. You'd rather go up against that game than Georgia, Tennessee. I oh, think okay. so. Okay. So that's what I was saying. If you had to pick one, uh, I guess you had to pick that one. So, yeah, it's crazy because Notre Dame Clemson's at 732. It's going to be a lot of a lot of fun night games. And, and then Georgia, Tennessee leading us into it. Yeah, Big pivotal Saturday down there, but two games to get through uh, Georgia Tech and then. Well, no, just one game to get through. Georgia Tech, we got mm -hmm. Syracuse after yeah. Miami. What a back-to-back back -back roadies. 
Not yeah. Schedule unkind, iron unkind to the Knolls. As far as you can go in a, in a conference in back-to-back roadies, from literally one tip to another almost. The tip of the country to the northernmost part of your conference. That's, uh, that's something. Huge footprint, this conference. Big footprint. Oh, man. Yeah, that's why the TV money is just rolling in. Markets. You got that big, the big market. You got that New York market. They love their Syracuse football, always have. Uh, Miami brings in, I mean, you see those crowds. People mm-hmm. are just feverish for the Canes. So, yeah, man, it's, it's been great. It's been great. Mm-hmm. Andrew Carter, who used to cover Florida State for the Sentinel, um, he wrote a story about, I guess today was like the 18th anniversary. Would that be right? No, it can't be right. It's been 18 years since, I guess, Miami joined the conference. Um, oh, okay. And basically, he yeah. wrote about how bad that was for the ACC. Like, they, they thought they were getting something, and clearly they got something else. Like, Miami has just been, you know, you know, I know Florida State hasn't been good for five years now, but Miami hasn't done anything in this conference for right. 18 years. Yeah. And you have to put in perspective for our younger listeners that are in their 20s, like Miami from, I don't know, man, 2000 to 2003 was the best program in the country. You thought you were getting Alabama. I mean, they, they, they won a national championship. They should have won another one. They had a ton of people drafted. You thought you were getting the best program in the country, that it was just going to keep feeding itself and being awesome. And then meanwhile, they have not, they played in one conference championship game, got crushed in it, and have not sniffed one. Um, so it's been a real disappointment bringing them aboard. And they have no, they, maybe they get good ratings in Miami for those games, I guess, but they have, they have no fan base at all, except when Florida State's there. It's an embarrassment. And I, I, I say that, as a guy that gets paid to go to games, so it's I've, I've always really cautioned myself from criticizing fans not showing up when I get paid to go. But looking at those state that stadium in every game they played this season at home has been an abject embarrassment mm. for the conference, for that school, for the state of Florida. It's just gross. Mm. Did you see the pictures from? The, yeah, did you yeah. text me a picture from yeah. that game? Yeah, the the screenshot. It's 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 embarrassing, man. What are you getting? Eleven thousand people, if that. I mean, it's it's just awful. It's just an awful look. But hey, they'll be there for their one game every two years um, next Saturday. So yeah, I was watching them. the. I was wondering too because on Monday night they were celebrating their what fifty year anniversary of the perfect Dolphin squad, and I'm like, oh, you know, right. this, yeah. do they they draw all right? I think for for Sundays, like, why don't if you're a Dolphins fan down there, I figured you'd also be a Canes fan, but it was mostly Pittsburgh fans and terrible towels that packed that place in too. So it's got. Too many important things to do in Miami, apparently, other than going to you know heat games or hurricanes. Yeah, in Atlanta used games. to have a ba- Atlanta used to have a bad rap as a as a as a sports town. Uh, a lot of that had to do with the Falcons and Braves being awful for so long in the eighties. But you know, you go to a Braves game now, it's it's Woo. maniacal. You can't get tickets. Um, the Falcons Falcons when they're good, they pack that place. Uh, they haven't been good for a while. But it's a it's a Falcons town. It's a Braves town. The Hawks, eh. Uh, that's not an easy place to get to, but Miami, you know, I don't know what, I, I mean, I know I'm not saying they don't have passionate fans. They clearly do. And I know the prices can be outrageous, but I don't, the Marlins are a joke. I mean, oh. nobody goes to those games I never have gone to those games except for that one month when they opened that place. And Ozzie Guillen was their manager before he said some things about Castro that he <laughs> immediately regretted. And then, uh, and then, um, yeah, man. And then the Canes and the Dolphins. Yeah, they don't, I mean, I think, but I, I give the Dolphins fans a pass because they've been so inconsequential for 30 years. I think if they make the playoffs this year, if they ever get on a run, it would be really cool to see that fan base active again. Because I do think they, they're just like laying in the cut. They're laying in the weeds to see how it goes. And if the Dolphins become like the two seed in the playoffs and get to host a playoff game, uh-huh. I really do think they'd show up. That's a, that's a long-suffering fan base that has not been any good really consistently in – Almost 40 years. Canes two and a half point favorites on the road in Charlottesville. Meanwhile, your Knowles 23 points. Man, it that is thing ballooned. keeps flying up, huh? It is swelling. 23 point favorite against Georgia Tech. The over under 47 and a half over at mybookie.ag. So they must they must know they must have a pretty good suspicion that Sims isn't playing. Or it doesn't really matter. It does matter though. I mean that yeah, you, that only guy's because real big you right, saw no, with that backup. Yeah backup looked like um jeff sims i mean hey he he owns doke man he's one and oh in that building but uh you know he can at least make some plays Uh, that other kid you know maybe with a week to prepare it'll be different but that must be because didn't you say it started at like 18 
Nine, I think it was 18 and a half. Someone said I saw 19 and a half on Sunday night. I mean, going up four points in a day. Yeah. Well, Fabian Lovett might be think... back. They're hopeful Fabian Lovett's going to be back. I think that might. Well, maybe that's it. Maybe they heard good news about zero. No, I, I think it has to be they're getting inside. They, they got some people that know that are telling them, uh, yeah, uh, their quarterback's not going to play. And you saw what that kid did against Virginia. So, yeah, keep raising that up. Coach him up, Chris. Chris Winky, the quarterback's coach at Georgia Tech. Both those guys look ill-prepared, so don't know what happened to Chris and his prowess. I mean, he was an NFL quarterback's coach there for a minute. Uh, now he's in Atlanta, hanging on by a thread. Good luck to you, Chris. Good luck to you. So, I hope, hey, I wonder if this is the first time he's uh, – I, uh, I got an email in to the Georgia Tech SID. I hope I can interview him. It would be cool to get him on the show, actually. Yeah. Although I don't know if he's the kind of guy that would do a show like this or just do interviews in general. Yeah. He's, but, he's, um, he's working on his Indeed resume and stuff. You know, he's at game planning all the time. You're right. Yeah, he time. should. He should open up. He should – yeah, but I wonder um, if he's been – when was the last time he was at Doak? I mean, I guess he's come back for some, maybe for some reunion stuff, but yeah, I bet yeah. it's been a minute since he was at Doe. Yeah, maybe like a 10-year reunion or something, I'm sure, for the 99 team. Because uh, 2009, I don't think he was, I don't even think he was an IMG. And he probably wasn't, he wasn't was coaching then, right? Yeah. He, I think he was out of the league by that point, and maybe he wasn't, yeah, he definitely was, and maybe he wasn't coaching by then. But yeah, he's a, you know, that's a bummer. Wasn't he at Tennessee? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he left the, he's he, just missing him. The, 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 these jobs he's getting, they're, they're not great timing here. Leaving Tennessee before they become this and then getting to Georgia Tech with that debacle. So then uh, we did speak to Coach Norvell, all the coordinators. I guess let's start off with the, the, the top guy here. Let's start off with uh, Mike Norvell. Uh, they're hopeful that Fabian's going to be back. That's probably the biggest takeaway on the whole uh, from Monday's press conference. Is anything else in particular you thought that Norvell shared that was – revealing or encouraging or uh, worth talking about here on this podcast Tuesday? Um, yeah, man, all of it. Go, I, I, you know, go watch it. Do we have that on our video? Do yeah. we have that on our channel? I was there working. I was working on a Monday. Yeah, go, yeah, go there. Go there and watch it, folks. Uh, I, 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 would, I would encourage you. Just, you got, you got time. What are you else are you doing? It's a bye week. Go see what your head coach had to say. Um, yeah, I think Fabian Lovett is the most um, encouraging part of it The in um, – you know, talking about Georgia Tech and and that I guess he knows Chip Long, right? So Chip Long worked with him. Yeah, Memphis hired him. Yeah, this is OC. So first yeah, OC. in Georgia Tech is or Chip Long is now the uh, the OC at Georgia Tech. Not again, that's not a great thing on his resume right now, but he's he's up against it with some injuries. But uh, yeah, man, I, I think that's interesting that he's coached against or he's coaching against a guy he hired that went from him to Notre Dame, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, that that's interesting enough. Fabian Lovett being back is is interesting enough. But you know, Norvell, after a game, he's great. That the next Monday, he's really good. But during a bye week, after a bye week, there's not much he's going to say that we haven't heard. Right? It's he, like Jimbo yeah. explaining. It's like Jimbo explaining why plays didn't work. <laughs> We've heard it all before, man. We get it. We, you're saying the same stuff over and over, just like Leave I do on this show. Alone. So he so he's saying Norvell's saying. A lot of the same stuff. Like he he loved he loved the way they went to their training sessions. Mm. He loved the way they attacked the training room during the bye week. I did think that was interesting. That um, I just made fun of it, but it is true. Not not that they went to the training room and attacked their training, but uh, or getting better. But like that, so many of them stayed in town yeah. that they didn't have to. Like they you know they get a free weekend. They let the kids go home. You know, especially freshmen might be homesick. They want to go see their girlfriend or their parents or whatever. Um, but he said a lot of the team stayed home, stayed back in Tallahassee. Most of the team, it sounded like. And that's, he, he seemed to be very encouraged by that. So I guess we should be too. Okay. He was really energetic. And he normally is on a Monday coming into that museum that lacks artifacts. Uh, yes. Full museum of, in name only. Yeah. Full of energy, bubbling over with energy. Uh, but I think I think this is a he's not going to say it. I might ask him at some point this week. I wonder if this is kind of Boston College esque, where he challenged them. You know, he told us afterwards he had challenged them going into Boston College to dominate, not necessarily play with an attitude of domination, Corey, but simply right, just go out there right. and dominate. Yeah. This feels quite similar to that. It, and he's you know he's trying to show respect to this coaching staff that he's going up against and this team. Obviously, his, his friend is the offensive coordinator, but, you know, it was very B.J. Daniels, Jimbo-esque, throws the ball great distances when he's talking about the defense. Mm, like, the extreme. defense, yeah, 
the, the extreme, extreme distances. Sorry, sorry thank yeah. you. Uh, the defense have been playing well here the last few weeks. They they make impactful plays, um, which is like, yeah, you can make a tackle for loss. That's impactful. But then what happens when you yeah. surrender second and fourteen? So that's going to be the challenge for them, man. Not not to look past them. Not to look over to Miami. I, I know we talked about on the show yesterday, and you mentioned, "Hey, listen, we've how long have you and I been covering this team together? And, and at what point uh, don't you realize you, you don't count your chickens before they're hatched?" But mm. I just, you know, hearing his confidence, hearing the way he kind of has to try to elicit some sort of, "Hey, hey, hey, this, this is a good team we're playing." You, you just kind of feel like this is a this is a get right game. They really should come out, play really extremely well, just show you kind of. Uh, the lessons they did learn in the first half of the season and, and put together a really good 60 minutes finally here that we haven't seen in, in maybe since that Boston College game. So uh, that's what, kind of what I took away, just that I think he realizes they've, they're have they going to be able to outclass this team, and now it's up to them to actually go do it. And somebody was like, hey, Aslan, no, no, uh, no style points. It doesn't matter. The only win that we've had that looked really good was Boston College, and look what happened after that. Touche. Uh, but again, the, the teams that you played after Boston College, not nearly as uh, where well, they are more overwhelming than what you got after this Georgia Tech game. So I just I don't know. Again, Corey, just is it important to come out and look really good? Re- return to form, if you will, that trajectory that you had in September. I mean, yeah, sure. It, it's good to go. It, it's important to go out and play well. Um, and he did say that, you know, he said it's you know, it's more about them than us. And I, I mean, they all coaches say that and he says it every week. But it is true. Like. You you could probably play a C plus game, and maybe win this game by ten points. Like you could not play well and still maybe win comfortably. But it would be cool for them to play an A game because they haven't in a while. Um, and then th- that's something to carry over into uh, the game that you know will still be challenging down there. Prime time, prime time, baby. Uh, the Knolls and the Canes. Um, uh, the the next Saturday night, it'd be good to have a win, and, and not just to have a win where you eked through it and kind of slopped around and just outclassed them, but where you, you did you did execute really well and just completely blow them off the field. Um, that would be great. That would be great to have a three-score lead at half. Um, we'll see. But again, we'll see how they, how they do with it. But yeah, I think that's, that is important. I think that's important just for the, for the rest of this season because you've got, like you said, your last two road games of the season coming up. And as bad as Miami is, and you're probably going to be favored in that game, and they'll probably be on their backup quarterback, that ain't going to be a cakewalk, man. So it'd be good to have some, just some confidence to be built, uh, reminding yourself what it feels like to win. It's been a month um, of, before, since they've gotten to break a rock. So at least getting to break a rock again and feel good about yourself again, get one step closer to bowl eligibility, all that I think is a big deal, man. And I, that would be uh, good for them to go out and play well on a Saturday, not just win. Winning is the most important thing, obviously. That Take care of that first. But it would be great if they won convincingly. With this hopeful return also of, of Fabian Lovett, Corey, what's, what do you think will be the biggest impact? Maybe we don't actually see it on Saturday because this will be his first game since the LSU game. So – this might be kind of, hey, 20, 25 reps. Let's get kind of back into game shape. That way we're ready to go uh, starting in, you know, it's, that's actually, will that be in uh, November, the, the Miami game? Yeah, it will be. Yeah, November. November 5th, buddy. You know, kind of get you ready. They, they remember how you play in November. So for you, just mm. what are we going to see, do you think, ultimately from the return to Fabian Lovett? Maybe not going against the best offense here, so maybe not a whole lot to take away, but ultimately if it's, do you think it's 20, like 20, if I set the over on like 24 and a half, like how many reps do you think we will see out of Fabian and just how important will his return be and how will we maybe see it tangibly, uh, at least with our eyes on Saturday against Georgia Tech? Yeah, and again, we weren't told officially that he is returning. It just it seems to be trending in that direction. Um, but I, yeah, I would say anywhere to 20 to 25. Whatever, what was Jared versus pitch count? Wasn't it around there his first game back? I want to say, yeah. Yeah, so I would say somewhere in there. And, man, it just gives those young guys a, a bit of a break. You know, Malcolm Ray, Dennis Briggs, they're not having to play every rep. Jared Jackson maybe gets some more work. Um, Robert Cooper. It, they all they all can benefit from just an extra body, man. That's that's five less plays for all of them, um, which is a big deal. And, and look, if you get a big enough lead, uh, like Florida State did against, well, I think Jared Versus first game back was Boston College, right? Or am I wrong? Yeah, it sounds right. Maybe I'll it was Wake. Check. I can't remember. It could have been Wake. Actually, no, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. Wake it was Wake. I apologize. If you get a nice lead, then yeah, you can. You don't have to play those guys a ton. Lovett can get his 20 to 25 snaps. 
do what he's supposed to do, and you get to see the picture of what maybe this defensive line is supposed to look like, what it did look like against LSU, and you get reminded, oh, yeah, this is a difference maker. Even for 15 or 20 reps, this is a difference maker. Now, next week, after more rest and more recovery and more strength, strengthening, you get 35 reps out of them. Then by the time Florida rolls along, 55. Like that, that's what you're hoping to see. You just you don't want to see any setbacks and you want to see the the same guy that that you saw against LSU. That would be great. That would just be great, I think, for the whole just to boost the morale of the team and of the defense and of the fan base to be like, oh yeah, that's right. This guy's an all ACC caliber player. Getting him back, look, now all of a sudden while he's on the field, there aren't these huge lanes to run through in the middle of the defense. I was gonna say that though, your last point. I, I think what hurt them so much against Clemson. I don't think it was so much interior line play as it was linebackers not doing run fits. So I don't know if maybe Fabian just blows things up so that helps uh, even if you're not able to get to your run gap on time if you're a linebacker, make the right read, yeah. you'll be all right because yeah, they certainly could have used Fabian against uh, Clemson, but Telvin Smith might have been a better help for them than, you know. But do you wonder do you wonder like maybe the linebackers are pinching inside more because they're so worried about the defensive interior of the defensive line and they don't want to give Shipley 14 yards right down the gut so they pinch inside and then that's how they got hit and beat on the perimeter like they did did they I, I feel like other than I know you really got upset about DJ uh, Uyunglele's touchdown run in the first half and then also we talked about that second down in 16 or 14 or whatever I think that went out the perimeter but some of the more ones that stood out to me I think were, were felt like power runs between the tackles is where they really kind of got beat on but to your yeah. point that could yeah, I, I could see that. If, if Fabian's not there, they don't feel as confident about what they have in the interior. Maybe they are kind of pressing a little bit, trying to do too much, and then that allowed them to bounce things to the outside. Good thing is I don't think Georgia Tech has any athletes like, you know, Will Shipley or DJ Uyunglele, especially if Jeff Sims or, can't uh, go. the kid at Alabama, the running back. Yeah. They did have him. They did. Jamar Gibbs, right? Jameer, Jameer Gibbs, yeah. Jameer, yeah, they had him, uh, but he ended up going to Alabama. I wonder if he regrets that decision. Yeah, it's weird watching that. It's, I, Part of me is like, hey, that kid deserves to have the best possible experience he can. Uh, it's it, yeah. he's talented, uh, you know. He wants to do what he can to maximize his potential. And part of me was like, man, but everybody had a shot at him. Georgia Tech's the one that gave you the shot that you felt the best about, and then you know you left them. You're all they had. You were all they had, and you just left. Well, compare them. that to uh, Albany. Yeah, they'd probably like Jared Verse back, right? Yeah. He was probably pretty important for their defense. I mean, if you outplay your recruitment, I get that. You know what I mean? I get it. Right. I, I I just, again, I can't stand the kids that leave in the middle of the season, announce they're in the portal with four games to go. That's just bizarre to me. Uh, but it's a reality, a fact of life. I'm just going to have to be an old man and scream at the lawn some more about it. Uh, but, yeah, man, I, I don't think anybody really begrudges it. It's not like he left Georgia Tech for Wake or NC. And Wake's obviously a very good program. I'm just talking about, um, like, fan attention. Yeah, it wasn't just strict, uh, it, strictly money, right? Like, I mean, he went he went to Alabama where he is he's treated like a god, man, and uh, he is he's a really good football player, and he's gonna go uh, he's gonna be an early pick, like first couple rounds, and at Georgia Tech he was gonna be in a debacle of an offense. I mean, they'd be better with him, but not much better. Um, so yeah, I mean, they weren't gonna beat Ole Miss with him. So uh, so yeah, I, I it's just yeah, but it is what it is. But they could use him, but they don't have him, do they? They don't have uh, Jameer Gibbs. Hey, folks, you know sports. You pick winners all the time, so why not get paid for them at MyBookie.ag? MyBookie, the biggest online selection of odds and contests for all your sports betting needs anytime, anywhere. Bet on the NFL, NBA, World Series, but you got to wait till Friday for that one. Or aim for a low-risk, high-reward jackpot with the all-new MyBookie Money Bag. Money Bag, one-of-a-kind opportunity to spin for crazy odds on props and futures, place a bet, spin the wheel, get ready to score epic odds on the best teams, athletes, and events. Sign up free today. Use the promo code WARCHANT. Claim a deposit match dollar for dollar instantly of any amount up to $1,000. I want to unveil this maybe tomorrow, Corey. Let's, now that you, to, your, to your column that you wrote the other day about now we have all this data. We all got ahead of ourselves when it comes to talking about Team X, Team Y, Team Z. Now we know, man. We've, we've had seven weeks or whatever, eight weeks to watch these teams. You and I, from here on out, every Wednesday, we're going to make three suggestions on, on oh, a game. okay. And then we'll okay. talk about it on Wednesday. So you have a day here now to uh, percolate on it and, and, and unleash on the mass. And then we'll see how we do 
Uh, we'll keep we'll keep tabs on it, and then I don't know. We'll, we'll pat someone on the back, or you'll buy me Zaxby's, or I'll buy you Zaxby's, or Deluna, or something like that, or some flats at the Corner Pocket mm, Bar and Grill. Flats at the Corner Pocket with my yeah. side salad. That's a good that's a good choice too. All right. Again, that's promo code War Chant to claim your bonus, and if you deposit between now and Halloween, you'll also grab 31, 31 free spins in the My Bookie Casino. Look at that! Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with My Bookie. How about the other guys, the other coordinators, Corey? We spoke to Adam Fuller. We spoke to Alex Atkins as well as John Papuchas. You know, Alex, I, I liked Alex kind of talking a little bit about he was kind of going somewhere with this thought about now that they've been through seven games, like they've they've finally figured out like their identity. They've, they've figured out the mistakes. We shouldn't see the same mistakes repeated, um, hopefully here, ideally. So that was something that kind of caught my ear a little bit. Uh, and then, obviously, when I talked to him at the end, the last question about uh, coaching rumor sort of stuff and uh, him, his answer I thought was, was pretty cool. I mean, it was pretty forthright and honest about it. Uh, what did you take away from Adam uh, – or, sorry, Alex Atkins' uh, performance, if you will, uh, his, his, his time on the podium Monday morning? Yeah, he was, uh, it was a good answer he gave you. Uh, Aslan asked him about his name being attached to job openings, which is clearly in reference to Charlotte. And he said – he's like, yeah, I used to watch that all the time, like – because you know these questions, but these guys know the question is coming, and they act like they haven't thought about it, or they're just thinking about this. And he's like, "Man, I used to watch that and be like, come on, man." And he said, and now he wouldn't, he didn't say that. He he was like, "Yeah, it's very flattering." He goes, "But uh, it is flattering to have your name out there." And then he he credited Norvell. He's like, "Look at Norvell's coach Norvell's assistants. They he's got some guys in some really good jobs, and that's a credit to him." He goes, "But mainly it's just flattering, and it's noise. It's like social media that doesn't mean it's reality." Uh, probably meaning he Charlotte might not have even reached out to him. It's just Bruce Feldman suggesting someone that's kind of an up and comer, younger on the younger side, and has a connection to Charlotte as as for his interest in that job. But he he certainly didn't decline interest, but it didn't sound like he was, you know, doing cartwheels at the thought of being the Charlotte head coach. But I could be wrong. I might be reading that wrong. Um, but yeah, I thought it was you know he said it before um, last week. He said it last week about the self scouting that they do that he he does anyway. And it sounds like to me, I, I couldn't tell if he was talking about the entire offensive line or the entire offense, but he said they had one-on-one. He said they had one-on-ones with all the players about three things they need to get better at. And they self-scouted the players. They didn't just self-scout themselves as far as scheme and what they're giving away and, and should they do more of this or more of that and, uh, you know, four wides, three wides, more two back. It, they, they didn't. It wasn't about that as much as they wanted to self-scout the players. And if they keep making the same mistake, why? Go back over their notes, see why they keep making the same mistakes, and if it keeps obviously if it keeps uh, uh, happening, they'll have to go to somewhere else. But he thought it was really good because he's like, once you get in the middle of a season, you don't really get a chance to do this to like take a step back and actually address um, the the development process uh, because you're just trying to win games. So I thought that I just thought that was interesting. You know, Fuller talked about what you'd think you'd talk about with self scouting. That was really hard to transcribe, by the way. I, I kind of went in a million different directions and didn't really kind of answer even the question. But Atkins, I thought, was on point, just talking about it's. You know, he said it last week. They give three areas because you don't want to overload them. Give each player three areas that they need to improve with data and information and and I assume clips. And, and real feedback of what they need to improve and why these mistakes keep hurting the team and why they keep making these mistakes and to fix them. So I thought I thought that was interesting. I thought that was something that uh, that uh, caught my ear a little bit. What do you think about Adam Fuller's response about the cornerback room? You know, he mentioned that Jarian probably much improved. Renardo's yeah. done a really good job. Uh, yeah. Azaria's pushing and then says that we're going to get Duke Cooper back. Oh, yeah, Anything. We, we, we're getting Duke Cooper back yet. Yeah, he's starting to play well. It's like, all right, we'll see. Um, he did say that, like, to me it sounded like, and I might be reading way too much into this, it sounded like um, maybe there's a change coming at the, the starting corner where it might be a Zarie. He's just like, I think the bye week, now that we're here and we get the bye week, it sounded like he was, you know, there, there was a, a chance to, like, jump into something else. And I can't remember how he worded it, and I'm too lazy to go back and read my transcript. But it was it was like that, like, okay, we've got this bye week. We're after seven games now. We see what's coming. That's exactly the way we phrased it. We see what's coming. I think meaning Azaria and Sam McCall. Um, so it'll be, so maybe moving forward, especially with Azaria, who's getting plenty of reps now as it is, maybe he gets more and more reps, and maybe it's twenty and eight 
are your main corners moving forward. Maybe they they like what they've seen out of Azarie the last two or three weeks. Yeah, I could buy I could buy Azarie. I mean, Sam McCall. Otherwise, he's only he's only apparently played in two games, twenty six total reps. So I don't know how yeah much he's going to factor into things. But obviously, Azarie is. Or really... maybe when he says we see what's coming, they see that Duke Cooper starting to look like himself again. That'd be I don't great. know. Well, that'd wouldn't be that great. be something? That'd be a that'd be a nice boost to this defense. Yeah, especially with Jared maybe a little bit healthier, and then Fabian obviously hopefully coming back here. Yeah, Zarie played uh, 33 against Wake, 25 against NC State, 19 reps against Clemson. He's at over 119. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it'd be nice to see if uh, what we got with him. But I think Duke Cooper being healthier is probably more of a pressing kind of. Uh, that'd be a little bit better, I would think. But yeah, just, the way, I think the, I thought the way he phrases it was, and we're getting Cooper back. I don't know if he means back as in. Back to healthy or back healthier or the guy that we've been missing for two months is shown back up. Yeah. But that's that's kind of how he phrased it, which would be great because, again, he has not been nearly the player all season. Yeah. He is not. He hasn't had one real – he hasn't had a good moment, really, that you remember. Um, and last year he was really good. Um, so that, that would be really nice for him to re- return to last year's form if he can find it. I know it's touchy talking about injuries and stuff. I think we can get away with talking about the fact that we've seen him at practice and we've seen other guys yeah. in green jerseys, which means they're hurt or, you know, at least don't hit this guy. We need to preserve them. We see that with some guys on the offense. But, you know, there's guys that are, that are out there defensively practicing with a green with a green shirt on. And, like, we've never seen that with, with Omari. Right. So that's that's been kind of the thing, the, the, not the frustration, but maybe like the disconnect between us thinking, okay, yeah, he's – we think he's good to go, but then we see what happens on Saturdays. But maybe this, you know, this week finally just being off of it was enough. Well, but the, it's not just not the green. It, it, you know, the green jersey would be something, but it's also there are moments where he's doing one on ones where he gets beat on a deep route and he stops running halfway through, like literally, kind of just gives up on the play. I just don't think Amarian Cooper is a guy that just has no fight in him. That's like, oh, I'm gonna, be, I'm beat. I'm stop. I'm gonna stop running. That's why I think there must be something yeah. physically, right? Would they even allow him to do that? Would you allow a corner that was mostly healthy or fully healthy to just give up on a play because a guy gets three steps on him? And that's happened multiple times we've been out of practice. Yeah. I, I do think that there's probably, there has been something there. Um, and it's been alluded to, Fuller alludes to it every week. Um, so it's definitely being alluded to. And I remember... Uh, what happened in the preseason? I saw him on eyes. So I know there was something. And I, you know, I, maybe it's just it hasn't healed the way they wanted to or hasn't been as quick as, as everyone expected. But again, it would be imagine going out there on Saturday. And again, it's Georgia Tech. We get it. And Duke Cooper plays 45 or 50 snaps and looks good. Hmm. Like it looks like himself. Man, again, you, you've got five games left where you can, you can do some good stuff. You got some good teams left, some good quarterbacks to face. Uh, it'd be nice to uh, to have that guy back in the in the holster. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we'll be back out of practice today and tomorrow, uh, but later on, one to three o'clock, seminal headlines. Corey Clark, Irish Show, Fell, Jeff Cameron, chopping it up, mm-hmm. talking about the Knowles and this upcoming game against Georgia Tech, and then we'll have another podcast for you, probably live Thursday. You're saying, Corey, probably live Thursday, this show. I think so. That's where I'm leaning. That's okay. where I'm leaning, buddy. Thursday. All right, which means. That'll be your Friday podcast. We'll probably do Renegade Express thread. It'll be up on Wednesday, and then we'll have that for your Thursday podcast. So, uh, But we'll have one before that as well. Five days a week. It's what we do. It's football season. No mm. days Amen. off. Amen. So, With that said, we'll go cover practice for you folks. Stay connected to Warchant.com, the ultimate symbol sports source. There's no promo code or anything needed. Just go to the website, Warchant.com, right on the front page. You can sign up for an entire year of access for only $10. I don't even know how it's working. I don't know how this math is going to keep us all, um, you know, with food on the table. But, hey, mm. at, least, at least we're doing what we love, covering the Knowles. For Corey. That's right. That's right. Well I'm said, Aslan. Aslan. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for listening to this edition of Wake Up War Chant. As always, presented by the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill.